Um, it was 1977, and I was most of the way through my seminary education at that point. And there was a, a wonderful man, uh, his name was Hilliard Camp, who was a pastor, who was a professor in the seminary, who was funny as he could be. He could entertain people for hours with the stories that he had in his head. He was a tremendous church historian, and he had church history as his specialty. He was a biblical scholar, and he was dying. He had cancer, and uh, the team, the administrative team at the seminary said, uh, Hilliard, um, we know you're sick, and you shouldn't have any teaching responsibilities at all. You're, you're too ill. Uh, he had to carry a glass of water around just because his mouth was so dry he couldn't speak if he didn't keep sipping on that straw that he had in the water. But if you had one lesson you wanted to teach, one more lesson, what would it be? What course would you teach? And without any hesitation, he said, the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. I only want to teach one lesson. He could, he could take all of church history, he could take all of scripture, and teach a whole semester, anything he wanted to. He wanted to spend his remaining weeks teaching John. And if I had to explain what it was like, I had a full schedule. I'd already committed to that full schedule, but when I heard that Hilliard Camp was going to be teaching John, and I loved him very much, I overloaded. I took his class in addition to a full schedule. <laughs> Just about killed me. <laughs> And I listened very attentively to my friend Hilliard Camp. Um, there's a little thing that I found that happens. Um, I had a little boy just under his two-year-old, in fact today is his two-year birthday. His name is Gideon. And I had him on my lap this summer, um, earlier. And he did a very strange thing. As we were sitting there and I was talking with him and we were sharing back and forth, his eyes never left my eyes. He looked at me the entire time he was with me. You know what that tells me? He was engaged. When you have a person's eyes, their recorder, their mental video tape recorder is running. And they are remembering. They're, they're making a deep impression. When they get too much stimulus, the first thing they do is glance away. If they can take their eyes away from you for a second, they can more carefully monitor their stimulation overload. <laughs> and with my big voice and white hair and all. Morning, Mr. Clayton. How you doing? Well, working on it. All right. There he goes. <laughs> anyway, uh, Gideon looked at me the whole time. Now, I have to be honest with you. I get the same reaction when I teach the Gospel of John, because people will be focused, and then suddenly they'll, <laughs> they get information overload, all right? They get too much that they, don't let that bother you if that happens, because it's happened to me so many times, especially in Hilliard Camp's class, because there's a lot to absorb, there's a lot to factor in, and uh, the reason I, the reason we videotape is so that if you need to, you can go back and catch a little bit of it again and say, now what was that? that, that I didn't quite get that point or I didn't understand that. Um, so it's there. It's recorded. It's on the net, two or three different places. And 
my dad used to say, be careful when you teach your children how to ride a bike. <laughs> All right? Because he said, if you push them a little too fast beyond what they're capable of being able to manage and keep it in control, you can actually cause them to crash. And that seemed to make pretty good sense to me. And so when I teach, I always give people the freedom to say, that's fast enough. <laughs> that's, that's, that's as much as I can handle right now. Okay, here we, here's what we're starting with today. If you look at your paper, we're going to be looking at the seven proofs. In the Gospel of John, uh, there are seven separate individual proofs that Jesus was God in flesh. Last week we talked about how God sent his son to come out from behind the veil of the temple, so to speak, and stand out where normal people live. He had come from behind where God lived, but he had stepped out from behind the veil. So how do you know that's true? How do you know that's true? For the writer of the fourth job, chapter, or fourth gospel, I want you to turn with me, if you've got your Bibles open, to John the fifth chapter, verse 31. Now, one of the things we said last week was uh, go through the gospel in your, in your Bible te text, if you will, and just circle the different references to legal terminology. Witnesses, testimony, testify, verdict, judgment, all these are legal terms that talk about uh, what the legal requirements are if you're going to give testimony in a court of law. Well, they didn't have a court of law specifically, but the Sanhedrin Council would take all of these questions and put them to the test and to see who was testifying and telling the truth. All right? and where the truth really stood in the midst of this argument. So here we're going to start to read just for a few verses. Verse 31, Jesus talking. Red letters and <laughs> if you have one of those scriptures. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. Now wait a minute, I thought you were supposed to testify and tell the truth. I tell, promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Okay? It's supposed to be true. Why is he saying it's not true? Because he's the only witness. Jewish law required a minimum of two confirming witnesses. If you only had one, you couldn't take that person's word for it. You follow? If you couldn't find somebody who knows that what you're saying is the truth and have them come to testify, you're out of luck. <laughs> your, your case is lost. Okay, so he starts off with that. This is John 5, 31. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. But there is another who testifies in my favor. I have a witness. And I know that his testimony about me is true. Now he has a second witness. See all the legal terms? The legal argument going on here? You have sent to John. Now we have to remember now, John's a very common name. As common as Bob is today. Anybody named Robert here? Roberta? Oh, that's one of the first classes I've ever had. I didn't have another Bob in the class somewhere. Because it's very common. John is a very common name. So who is he talking about here when he says, you sent to John and he testified to the truth. Who is this? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. All right. Uh, I'm going to say it just a little. The John the Baptizer. I don't want him to get a denominational <laughs> credit. All right. <laughs> okay. So John the Baptizer <clears throat> testify to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it to you that you might be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, 
and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. Okay, so the testimony of John is true, and you enjoyed it, and eventually it offended you, but John was there. He was telling the truth. I have testimony weightier than that of John. <clears throat> For the works that my Father has given me to finish, the very works I am doing testify that the Father has sent me. So what's his third witness? He has John the baptizer, and who's the third witness? God himself. <laughs> God himself. All right? He testifies. All right? He's not done yet. And he testifies concerning me. And then we're going to jump down to verse 40. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to, to me to have life. So the scriptures themselves are his fourth witnesses. Okay? He's not quite done. I do not accept the glory from human beings, da, 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 but verse 45, but do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you have not believed what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? Who's the fifth witness? Moses. Now, why is Moses so important? He was the father of the nation. He was the lawgiver. He was the one who rescued them. He was the one who pronounced the ten plagues on Egypt. He was the one who raised his rod and the sea opened so they could walk through on dry ground. He was the one who gave them water to drink when there was no water, either by throwing a tree into a poisoned pond or by tapping a rock and having the water sprout out of the rock. He was the one who guided them through 40 years in the desert, one whole generation died in the desert. Yes. Now he was the one, he was the prince of, in Egypt, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Because they found him in the... Uh-huh. The, uh, the bull rushes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, you're right. So he was raised in the court, uh -huh. so he knew all the all law. And he knew all the things about what it took to make a nation. He had been completely <laughs> trained as king. Now, they didn't call him a king in Egypt, they called him a pharaoh, but it was the same role. And he had everything, every training he needed to be the lawgiver, the organizer, the judge, the, the ruler of Israel. Because he'd grown up in that Pharaoh's house. Okay? So, Moses wrote about Jesus. And they haven't believed his report. So Moses is the fifth witness. Now, what I want to do... Boy, it, it, it almost seems like it's the job's too big. We have seven proofs. Let's start in the second chapter of John. If you'll go into the, uh, into the second chapter, I'm, I'm going to take one step further. In the verses just before we turn over into chapter 2, the writer tells about Philip and Andrew listening to John the baptizer as he testifies and said, this is the one that God sent to save the world. <coughs> this is the one. And Andrew and Philip were the first two to begin to follow Jesus. They left being disciples of John the baptizer, and they began to follow Jesus. Where are you staying? Come and I'll show you. You can read the, the exchange there. <laughs> but that doesn't tell the whole story. Not yet. 
because there was a third disciple following Jesus. Who would it have been? No, it, Peter didn't come till later. I'm reading lips. <laughs> the writer of the fourth gospel. Remember what he said. Remember what he said. There's not a word in this book that is not my personal testimony of what I have seen and heard. What does that mean? It means I cannot testify to hearsay. That testimony doesn't work. It's not admissible in court. I want you to know for sure who Jesus is. So in order for you to know exactly who Jesus is, I rely completely on my testimony. I saw it. I heard it. You can believe what I'm saying because I am the witness to everything I saw and heard. Take a step back into chapter 1 and you'll hear that the chief priest and the rulers of the temple wanted to find out if John the baptizer was really thinking he was the Messiah. Now, in, uh, in simple terms, uh, I love doing little mind games, kind of like a challenge to remember. Who was John the baptizer? Cousin. The son of? cousin of Jesus. He was the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth. What was Zechariah? <clears throat> a priest. You have to remember this. Zechariah was a priest that served in the temple. Being a priest was not something that you made as a career choice. <laughs> it was a birthright. So what did that make John the baptizer? A priest. A priest! Fully trained, fully equipped priest in the temple in Jerusalem. Okay? So the chief priest, the, 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 the ones who said, this guy is one of us. He is one of our group, this sort of a, a family. It was the family of Aaron. He is doing some very strange things. He's taken off all of his priestly robes. He's thrown off all of the vestments and the symbols. He's thrown away everything that makes him appear like a priest. He doesn't cut his hair, cut his beard, or eat like us, or talk like us, or think like us. Who is he? Does he think he's the Messiah? <laughs> so they sent representatives from the priestly circle down to the Jordan River to talk with him. Now, if you get a picture of Jerusalem, I mean, you have to go, the temple's in Jerusalem. It sits on top of a mountain. Jericho sets down at the bottom of that same mountain, okay? And then when you get to Jericho, you have to go across the flat plain of Jordan to get to the river where John the baptizer was working. So the, the mountain pass from Jerusalem to Jericho was a tough one, very difficult, very challenging. It was a rough footpath down the mountainside because Jericho is not only at the bottom of the mountain, it's below sea well level a thousand feet. So it's way down in a hole. So the, the priestly delegation would not have walked to John in one day. They stayed to talk with him. It was a hard trip. Are you the one? No, I'm not the one. But he says, I can tell you the fact that I saw the one who will come to save Israel 
and God opened my eyes and I could see a dove come down that represented the Spirit of God and stayed on him and landed on him as an indication that I had already been given ahead of time that was the finger of God pointing to this man. And I testify that I saw the Spirit of God come down and land on him, and he is the one. Okay? So that's the testimony. Who else was listening to this exchange? We're reading out of the Gospel of John. So who would have been reporting this? <laughs> the writer of the fourth gospel. How many disciples does Jesus have at this point? He's just been baptized by John. How many disciples does he have? None. None. He's got a couple of kids, one of them named Andrew and one of them named Philip, and a tag-along guy walking along behind him, but he has no other disciples. This is a brand new thing. Okay? Follow him. He's the one. So, then they meet Peter, and they meet Nathaniel, and now I'm going to turn to chapter 2, verse 1. All right? Because it's very important. On the third day, uh, take a moment and just factor this in. Third day from what? Him being baptized, beginning to walk, talking to Peter, talking to Nathaniel, having Philip, Andrew, and the witness who's going to write us the story. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Was the writer of the fourth gospel invited to the wedding? Yeah. Otherwise, he wouldn't be reporting it. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been telling us this part of the story. Because remember, he has promised to only tell what he's seen and heard. Okay? Now, why is this so terribly shocking? Why is John considered the most undependable gospel of the four? Because what do the other three gospels say he did as soon as he was baptized? Where did the Spirit drive him? Out into the wilderness. I knew you'd come through for me. Out into the wilderness for 40 days. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> I once had a fellow, a wonderful man in my congregation, his name was Wayne Pribble. Very smart guy. And he said, Pastor Bobby said, I have decided that I'm going to write the final authoritative harmony of all four of the Gospels <laughs> into one unified account that will take a timeline. And uh, I said, my friend, can't be done. <laughs> can't be done. Won't happen. Why? Because the Gospels are different. Are they inspired? Yes. Are they equally inspired? Yes. But they tell very different stories For because do you want to know how no, I teach sir. it? No, no, no. Do you know how I teach it? Here's how I teach it. All right. <laughs> I brought this with me last week. I didn't, I didn't have time to show it. All right. There you go. What, what have I got here? <laughs> it's actually a footstool for my workshop. When I can't reach what's on the top shelf, I get this down. Tell me what you see on this side. Under the pattern. It's a pattern. It's a rose window, if you want to know. I was trying to make a stained glass rose window. What's the color? Sort of a 
pinky, rosy color. What do you see on this side? Uh, uh, green windows. Green window? How many windows are there? Three. Three windows? How many windows over here? Six. Just one. It's a rose window. Just one. And what do you see here? Church doors. A the white church wall. door. And what color is the building? White. I'm sorry. All of you are wrong. You're just wrong. Because from where I stand, 1,000 feet in the air, uh, it's something completely different. Now, I had that made up for last week, and I didn't have time to get it worked in. So I had to find a way to get in. No, I didn't. No. You look at the four guys. <laughs> Yeah, going to the elephant. Uh, Judy handed me that same one. She said, I said, it's too long. I can't get into that. I'll use up my whole time. All right. So if you look at what each one of the people saw, they saw it correctly. It was just that the big, the, the plan was too big for one person to get their eyes around the whole thing. Okay. So let's just talk for a second here about what happened in this first miraculous sign. Jesus was at the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. <laughs> I can see Mary smiling at him. Come on, son. Come on, son. <laughs> he, she turned to the servants and said, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone jars. Do you have that circle in your Bible? Six stone jars? You ought to have that circle. Very important. Uh, six stone jars were used for ceremonial washing. They contained somewhere between 25 and 30 gallons. They were hewn out of a limestone chunk, and it sat next to the door of the house. So when you came in, some servant or another could take a dipper out of that stone vessel and pour it over your feet after you'd kicked off your shoes so that you could get rid of all the um, um, accumulation <laughs> you might have picked up out there in the pathway where all the donkeys and the sheep and the dogs and the different livestock would have left their little deposits along the pathway through the city. There was no sewer system, so it was just, they made the, the, the streets in such a way that everything ran sort of to the middle and downhill. That's why the wealthy people lived at the top of the hill. <laughs> and you get the picture of what's happening down at the bottom of the hill, where the water comes down, and turns and goes down the valley and out what they call the dung gate. Okay, so when you came in, you had smelly feet. Well, you couldn't come to a wedding and have a party with smelly feet. So they would take these water jars and they would dip out a little and they would wash off the accumulation you'd brought into the house. So Jesus turned to his, his uh, servants and said, fill all six of those stone jars with water. Go out to the well, bring back enough water so that all six jars are completely filled all the way to the brim. If you even put so much as one single grape in the jar, it would have spilled water over out of sight because there was, there was no way to add anything more to it. And they filled the stone jars to the brim. And then Jesus said, now go take a sample of that to the master of ceremonies who was running the wedding. So they took a little dipper and they took it to the man in charge and he tasted it. And he was shocked. He went to the bridegroom and he said, 
everybody serves the best wine before everybody gets, uh, let's say, involved in the wedding process. A little less fussy about what they're drinking or enjoying, all right? But you saved the very best for now. Where had the wine come from? water. I want you to understand there is no wasted space in the fourth gospel. It isn't just being trivial. It isn't just for recreational purposes only. There's a lesson to be learned here. Now I happen to have been trained in chemistry. I started with organic chemistry, or with the inorganic chemistry, and I went over into organic chemistry, and I found out that's really hard. So I quit. <laughs> Study something else. <laughs> Why? Because you can take inorganic chemistry, and you're talking about water and iron and lead and all the, chem the, uh, the elements of the creation and the compounds that they make, and it's very interesting. It's wonderful. I was fascinated by it. But when you get into inorganic chemistry, which means something living has taken in those elements and changed them by the process of living. All right? You take a vine and you put water on the ground around the vine, that living plant takes in the water and through the process of photo, photosynthesis, which I do not understand, <laughs> it links the water in interesting ways, breaks down the chemical bonds, and turns it into juice that it stores in each individual grape. Then you take the grape and you crush it and you strain out the juice and you put it in the right environment and over time it becomes wine. But you can't have water become wine without going through a living process. The process of living life. In this particular case as a grapevine. So what actually happened? Where did all those chemicals come from? Jesus is the tree of life. You see, as a chemist in the year 2021, there is still not any way for me to engineer water to be turned into wine. I mean, I can make something with that chemical makeup in the laboratory. You don't want to taste it. <laughs> not that you should. No, not that I'm suggesting that you should. But just because it comes in that chemical format doesn't make it wine. Jesus did something that was tied to the very Genesis 1 miracle. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning God created. He spoke it into existence. He just wanted it to be so, and it was so. Okay, that's on one level. Let me talk to you to the next level. Nobody in that room was a chemist. They couldn't understand the chemical reactions anyway. That wasn't a part of their world. What did they re remember? That Jesus turned the water to wine. I hope they remembered that, but what was even more important? It was more powerful than anything Moses ever did. You see how Moses was the testimony? Um. Moses did this, Jesus did this. 
What would be the similar miracle? What did he do when he tapped the, his rod on the stone? That water came out. In Moses' day, tapping the stone caused water to pour out. But when Jesus had the stone jars filled with water, wine came out. Do you follow? So which is the more powerful miracle? Water's everywhere. It can spring up out of the ground just about any spot you might think. Now, out of a rock, that's pretty rare. <laughs> I mean, I was there in Petra. I saw where the rock is still pouring out water. I mean, I, you know, it's pretty good water. <laughs> is that that island of our mission station? No, this is in Petra. It's south of Jordan, out oh, in the desert. All right. It's a red rock city. It's an amazing oh, okay. place. Okay? But, but I have to say that God, God did both of those miracles. God Absolutely. God did the miracle Amen. for Moses. And I don't think it was a lesser miracle. I think it was the miracle that was needed. I, I think, and I don't mean to contradict you, but, but to me they're both equally yeah. important, equally of, of, of value. Oh, oh no, 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 no question. Absolutely, and here's the, here's, I wasn't diminishing Moses. I mean, he, he's going to stay at the top of my list as God's I'm man. I'm just saying it wasn't, it wasn't Moses' miracle, it was God's. Well, yeah, but Moses was the one who, who called out to God for help, and God answered by bringing water out of the stone. Jesus brought wine out of the stone, so that he could say, Moses testified about me. And Moses would say the same. What did John the Baptist say? This is the one, I'm not, follow him. That was John's testimony. I'm lesser, he's greater, I'm going to diminish, he's going to get more powerful, follow him. That was Moses' testimony also, you see. I did what I was supposed to do, exactly as you say, but by doing even more, by making wine come out of the stone jars, you should follow him. He is going to become the one that you're going to follow. Now, when I stop and say that, <clears throat> I want to just take a second because on verse 12, no, I'm sorry, verse 11, this Jesus did when he was in Canaan of Galilee. This was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. You see, that is the point of John. John is written so that you can know. So that you can be absolutely certain. You can be absolutely convinced at a deeper level than you've ever been before. All right? Um, when you stand at the top of a well, all right, think of the old wishing well idea, and you look down in the well, how do you know how deep the well is? You can see the water down there, maybe. But how do you know how deep it is? That's the same way with certainty. When we were a child and thought like a child and believed as a child, we saw things as a child sees. I knelt down beside my bed as about a five or six year old boy. I don't remember exactly, but it was about five or six, they tell me. <laughs> my mother told me. <laughs> and prayed the prayer and asked Jesus to come into my heart. And I was absolutely convinced. I, I was absolutely convinced that I love Jesus with all my heart. But did that work when I turned 21? See, by that time I was a man. And I thought 
as a man, and I could believe as a man. And when God said to me, <laughs> it's time to come into an adult relationship. <laughs> okay, you've been baptized. Okay, yeah, you've, you've been through the whole process. Bring a preacher's kid, you know, I mean, pretty well. I knew the Bible stories by heart long before I knew any of the other nursery rhymes, all right? But it was time to come to Jesus in a, an adult way. And then he called me into ministry. Some 45, 47 years ago, something like that. At this point, I can look backwards and say I had no idea who Jesus was because I have taken bucketful after bucketful after bucketful out of that well. That certainty, that absolute confidence, that faith, and I've not reached the bottom of the well. There's still more down in there. My hope, my prayer, at the end of this hour, the end of this little lesson, you can look into your life and say, I think I have been a friend of Jesus my entire life. But when we look into the fourth gospel, my hope is that we'll begin to go, oh my goodness, I didn't really realize how much there was there. How certain I could be. How convinced I might be in a lower level in my heart than I had ever seen before. And so we're going to be starting with the second miraculous sign. And uh, the second miraculous sign comes on uh, chapter 5, I think. Oh, no, uh, chapter 4, verse 43. Second miraculous sign. There are seven. He names the first three and says, this is the second miraculous sign. This is the third miraculous sign. The other four he doesn't call out specifically as one of the miraculous signs. But when I've gone through my Bible in the margins, written number one, number two, number three, number four, so that I can recognize that we're about ready to read the story of the second miraculous sign. And then, as you read those signs, as you look through the, the papers and read them, what does this teach me? What does this demonstrate about Jesus? What insight does this give me? How does this make Jesus the test, the, what, what does that testify about Jesus, about who he is and what he came to be? And so uh, when I think about that, that's, that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about. I read the miraculous sign, I read the story, get to the point where I'm saying, okay, here's what we're doing. And then next week we'll zip through the other six signs and kind of get a highlight of what they each teach and how tremendously important. You cannot, how do I say this carefully, I'm not calling anybody's salvation into question. You follow? Not being able to answer one of my questions, as silly as they are, you did well, you got an A for the day, doesn't make you any less of a Christian. But learning and growing does build your relationship with Jesus Christ. And so my hope is that we will be able to see this and you'll go, wow. And amazed. Because that's what the fourth gospel writer said. He said, I had no idea when I turned around from John the baptizer and started walking down the road behind him what I would see. But when I saw what I did, when I witnessed what I witnessed, I can tell you, this is amazing. This is absolutely unbelievable. Okay? 
Any questions? Any comments? Thank you. Why don't you join with me in a word of prayer? Dear Jesus, it is worthless to teach if your spirit does not appear and stand over the head of each person just as it was at Pentecost. And your light, your presence, your insight, your wisdom radiates through us to understand who Jesus is even more clearly. We ask you this morning that you will breathe your breath into us. You will whisper that wind within us. You will break open that light within us and give us a whole new vision of what your word really holds for us in this treasure trove that is the Gospel of John. We thank you, Lord, for loving us, for working with us, for being patient with us, for guiding us along the steps of this path. And we'll give you the glory and the praise in every way. Amen. Thank you.